in another video of Make Capitalism History, and today it will be about transvolution. How a post-wage society, communism, arises from the common seed form, how reform stabilizes capitalism, about the dangers of revolutionary romanticism, the pitfalls of alternative economic practices, and how a combination of commons, grassroots organization, and social movements could overcome capitalism. Transvolution, which is a combination of transformation and revolution, whereas transformation often is part of being only within the capitalist system, and revolution too much oriented on like conquering state power and all these um, traditional I, pictures that come to mind. We kind of combined it. I like some people who <laughs> prefer transformation or revolution or whatever. It's just that we have like kind of a different take on it. Um, so. Within this concept, we talk about three general contracts of societal transformation. These will be reform, revolution, or construction. Re reform is the kind of the politics of small steps. And if you think about it as a picture, a symbol, then you will have like a mountain that you slowly climb step by step. There's a lot of continuity. There, it's within the existing structures. And finally, it, it stays within the capitalist structure. Maybe it will then come a turnover or something, but um, largely stays within the capitalist structure. And the state is logically the tool. We already talked with other videos that this kind of transformation is very limited because the state doesn't have that much autonomy to do whatever needs to be done ecologically and socially. Um, but still, it's an important idea of transformation. The other one would be revolution. It's kind of the politics of the great leap. If you think politics is kind of jumping over a gorge or something. Um, and it's about a sudden break. And you have two children of revolution, the state socialist revolution kind of stuff, where it's about taking the state power in a sudden break. And then you have a post-revolutionary planning state that kind of um, creates the new society. And there the state is again the tool that you use to do it. And then there's the anarchist revolution. Um, and it's a lot about the destruction of the state. It's about post-revolutionary self-organization but also like before the break and therefore it's also linked to the third part it's about construction and it's about the politics of practice about building alternatives and in our um, mode we strengthen a lot this construction part and it becomes very important in our thinking of change. Traditional ideas really that there is a political transformation, then the change of state power, and then the change of reproduction at the end. The traditional Marxist idea of reform and revolution are really two different ways to conquer state power. And we think construction is really important for this transformation. It's about the economic side of the transformation, whereas these traditional ideas, they only look at the political part. So we think that this economic transformation with this political organization must be far of together to build a bottom-up anti-authoritarian way of transformation. And to think about this construction part in more detail, to get like some concepts how to do it, we <clears throat> used the seed form theory, we took it over from the critical psychology, there are a lot of other um, theories that we've prefigurative practices or in the interstices of capitalism, there are a lot of theories that kind of do similar things but maybe our theory might also help to think about this change. So seed form theory is pretty straightforward. There's a seed form where a new reproduction logic um, is there on a small scale. Then this new production, reproduction logic becomes societally dominant, which we call the change of domination. And then there's the restructuring of the whole society, the reorganization of the society as a whole. Um, to have an example to think about it in a more concrete way. The change from feudalism to capitalism can be thought of with these terms. You will have exchange and markets within the feudal system, but they are very limited. But within the early modern period, from 1500 to 1800, you will see a small extension of the markets on the one hand, but they also change their quality um, because the competition becomes very important and a lot of political privileges like monopolies and tax privileges will get abandoned and then competition becomes very important and real capitalism kind of starts with these competing markets. And the market within feudalism has this doubled functionality. It's, it's functional to feudalism because um, the, the nobility gets money and they get a lot of production. But on the other hand, it's incompatible because it's a different logic um, and you see all these conflicts between the city-states and the nobility and 
the merchant class. So within the 18th to 19th century, you have the change of domination, the markets um, dominate social societal coordination for at the beginning usually it's part of to be England and then Europe and then it gets exported via imperialism and colonialism to the rest of the world and then you have the restructuring of the whole society so you have industrialization, proletarization, commodification and all these things going on. So if we think about our seed form, the seed form is of course um, we call it the commons, you also could call it solidarity practices or whatever that's like the term that we use it makes sense for us the commons are traditionally thought of these parts of the land that are used together by a small village and that you'll see in the bottom right corner um, a part of the land of the village is used for collective grazing and they give themselves the rules how to use it and how many sheep can be there but hunter-gatherer societies some of them are so egalitarian that all of the things produced are kind of commons they're used for needs and they're not and the exchange logger is not at the base there's a lot of um, giving to each other without like always wanting something back it's a lot about generalized reciprocity not this exchange logic like, that's finally linked to market um, but you also will find in wikipedia where like articles are produced for the general public so that you can just use it and don't have to buy it so here science becomes a commons but also a lot in social movements you'll see a climate camp where the things that we do are based on these two principles that we link to commons and to communism, voluntariness on the one hand and collective disposal on the other. And you'll find these in a lot of social movements and they're very important. And now how, <laughs> with the transvolution, the big question is the change of dominance. How do we get from these small seed form theories that are in a lot of places to this big societal change? Um, and a change of dominance can be thought of in different scenarios that we um, think about in the book or write about in the book. First, they can be kind of functional to capitalism. So Wikipedia was kind of, it was just cheaper than a lot of other um, lexicas. That's how they became um, functional to capitalism or also like open source programming, all this kind of stuff. It was also functional to capitalism, but a lot of stuff isn't. So it, is, it doesn't work out that good. Um, there's also this concept of state support that you have like commons public partnership where the state helps the commons to um, come around and come into being. You will see this a little bit, or not that much, because finally commons are thought of to be beyond market and state because it's a lot of a collective organization about democratization, kind of state critically in the end. So why should he just go on with it all the time? We'll need if it helps him. Um, the, within the commons theory, there's a lot of time this idea of slow expansion of the commons where you create more and more and more and more and then finally everything is commons. And we strengthen a lot the fourth pound, which is like this combination of commons and social movements becoming a commons movement and to overcome the capitalism. There are some pitfalls of commons. If you think of the capitalist seed form, this exchange and market logic, it was possible to create cooperation between people that don't know each other at all. And we call this anonymous cooperation transpersonal, whereas there's the interpersonal cooperation between people that know each other. And the capital seed form is basically very transpersonal from the beginning onwards. And the commons, if you look at CSA, community supported agriculture, what they will do is create a, um, for certain um, producer of vegetables, um, a certain group of consumers and they are very in closely linked to each other and, and that's how they can commonize or can get rid of some of the market relations there. So, but that's an uh, interpersonalization of uh, before transpersonal relationship between producers of vegetables and consumers of vegetables. We also say that commons are rarely functional to capitalism because they include a, a lot about externalities that are used to capitalism where it's like destruction of environment or, or exploitation of workers and also pitfall is this idea of uh, peaceful expansion it's a practical result because commons are done much based on the logic of inclusion where you kind of always try to find good um, solutions to conflict this practical um, experience commoners often put over on the societal change where they say this should be the similar thing we just um, have there are no conflicts we can we are complex but we'll find solutions and this just basically doesn't work because there are class structures there are property structures and we have um, to change things and socialization is very necessary there we can't just buy the whole capitalism we also have to socialize things 
Um, and this peaceful expansion is also a dismissive of the macro society and of um, very a lot of times it's linked to individualization. I just do my own thing and get um, isolated and produce my own vegetables and housing or, or whatever. And of course, it makes sense to do this in a way that you have more possibilities to create your own world. But finally, we're human beings and we're dependent on a lot of things. And in the end, if you want a smartphone, you won't do it on your own vegetable garden. <clears throat> so it's kind of also neoliberal in a sense, this idea. Um, there also comes into the question, should there be a second um, seed form next to commons because they're often so interpersonal and small planning as a second seed form. So we think about commons as a movement and today's movement are often, often common space whereas the traditional wor workers movement there was a lot of hierarchy within it, a lot of authority and now our social movements, you see climate movement or feminist movements or, or um, social justice movements, a lot of times there will be a lot of voluntariness and collective disposal about who decides what, what do we want to do. And this is very, they're very commonized in a way. And within this movement, if they gain power, they will use their structures to change society. And that also gives hope, kind of. You also have a distinction between reproducing and fighting commons, that some commons will orient it, um, at reproducing for the movement and some of like fighting and gaining resources and socialization. So it's the commons within and for the movement. And you could think of social movements as economy of commons in the end. Thinking about transformation and change is very important to think of possibilities and Kairos, is, which is like the god of possibility in ancient in Greece. It's important to think when do we have the possibility to really change something at a bigger level. And crisis may be a possibility there. This crisis may be an objective crisis when like a financial crisis 2008 or like really with climate <clears throat> disasters, bad things happen and then commons and cell phone organization becomes kind of an alternative for a lot of people. Um, but it also may be a subjective crisis and if like um, social movements are pushing the boundaries and it becomes clear to more and more people that we really need to overcome capitalism, we need a different um, socio-economic system, then we have a subjective crisis. <clears throat> Some remakes now on concrete organization. If we ask for things like prices must tell the truth or align markets with the common good or an effective and high carbon tax, <clears throat> then it's the question, are we supporting the green capitalism fairy tale with our politics? Because capitalism is really good with one thing. It will tell you whatever you want. You want a social justice, you want a green economy, just do it. I'm so flexible. I can do whatever you want. You just have to fight for it and then we can make it happen. And this is essentially not true. The state as an actor who can like do such kind of stuff doesn't have the autonomy and towards the economy to do it. Finally, it's about profit and also the state has to look after um, the profit economy. And if it's not enough profit there, then all the tax structure and the state structure doesn't work. So basically, with a lot of politics, we may stabilize something that we really want to get rid of and um, even create this fairy tale myth. What we want to say is that like hopeful reforms often stabilizes the system. Systems usually reproduce by reforms. It's like important for societies to have reforms so that, it, that they change. So if we ask for a high UBI or carbon tax and global justice, this may finally stabilize the system, especially if it's not possible to really change something in the system on a bigger scale, then all these with all these reforms, we create the image of a good capitalism, of a good market economy that's so nice to us and everything. And so we orient our politics towards and strengthen trust in the existing institutions. We emphasize imminent possibilities. So we produce, consolidate and romanticize capitalist po possibilities mentally and practically. So it's important we can't really go without reformism. It's a part where we start people usually, if they want to change something, they will think about reform and not uh, um, revolution and a new kind of society or transformation. They first will think about reform so we really have to be part of reform fights, but still bring into this this um, transformation idea, transvolution idea, that we emphasize the systemic limits, that we construct commons within these movements, but also really push them toward a different 
um, society. I think it's really difficult for within social movements to don't be part of creating this fairy tale of a green, um, just market economy, but still fight together for, <coughs> um, uh, you know, reformist way. It's also about about being against revolutionary romanticism. There's all these dangers of spontaneous change, of like counter-revolution, of weapons. It's very important to build alternatives and organization before there is um, sudden change. And sudden change may be part of all societal changes, um, but it must be well organized with alternatives there where we can show we can live different. Here you can see, you know, and gaining broad support will all be also be very important. So if we think about the different societies that are out there, these free possibilities <clears throat> to destabilize the vision of an eco-social market economy, we really have to undermine the trust in the state, that the state doesn't have the possibility to change these things finally, that it's dependent on profit, on the market going well, and therefore finally can change things on the level that we really need right now. The command economy, we have to get money trust in the commando, in the hierarchy. And um, there are also people at the top that should tell the others what to do and that's the best thing to go for. And so for the post-wage society, it's very important for people to experience commons and to just live in a different way and to build trust between people because trust is very important for such a society. And what neoliberalism and capitalism does is it destroys a lot of trust between people and puts hierarchy and money there. And therefore, it's also important to commonize everyday lives. That means households, but also our economy, what we can do in movements, in um, universities or whatever. Commonize everything. A thing that John Holloway puts forward a lot of times, and I think it's kind of um, something that also gives you, gives me strength at least, it's that there's a lot of everyday resistance. And if we think about big, fractures as like the separatists in south of mexico or rojava in um, northern syria or like climate movement these are like the big fractures but these fractures they come from small cracks and there's this everyday resistance that somebody um somebody in a care sector um still tries to really care for people although they don't have the time for it that's like a small fracture people who say after doing my stupid job that i'll go out and do my urban gardening that's a small fracture people try to um, fight in their job only if it's an individual fight um, to um, have a better better work there it's also a small fraction all these fractures combined could um, and all these small cracks together could make a big fracture. So Holloway has this term that the left commits countless suicides by saying like that these are not part of us and they don't really count. These are these small cracks can be the basis of the big fractures that we need. So um, finally, something that may help to think about this change and what needs to be done is for this commons movement three different elements might be of importance there's on the one hand of course the commons sector where we create commons there are the social movements um, where the commons are part of but they also contribute to the commons and grassroots organization either be it on the within the work sector or university or <clears throat> within the city or something and connecting organizations or the connecting organization. I'll leave it to you to discuss this kind of stuff. But I think it's important to think about these three parts. We don't only create comments. That's like not the most important thing. We also need organization and social movements out there. Um, and we need to connect them to really have to get over to the transvolution. So thanks for listening and see you later.